self-help. Here. Mr. Carlotti. Be contender. Here. Joe Cadney. Here. Lynn Hunter. Here. Carl Neubauer. Lucy Rojas. Here. Amy Kaplan. Here's Jeff Crum. Here. Suzanne Bundy. Here. And just a reminder, the testimony will be taken after 10.30. And uh, with that in mind, Madam Chair, uh, I've just been made aware during the break that one of my experts is not available for the next scheduled meeting of this board, which I believe is the 10th of February. As such, I originally intended to call Mr. Drinkwater at this point, but I would now like to call um, Al Al Alexander Warney to complete this testimony. <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, I believe the board's already accepted Mr. Lewarney as a traffic expert. Yes, we have. Can you spell his last name for me? Sure, it's L I T W O R N as in Nancy I A. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Barber, just put, we're qualifying as engineer and planner? Uh, no, uh, he is a, a traffic engineer. We're qualifying him as a traffic engineer. And I would like to um, mark, if you would, as 016, uh, his uh, curriculum by tape. Mr. Lamorne, are you familiar with the, uh, the property in question on Block 71, Lot 4.01, located along the north side of Wayne Street? Yes, sir. I certainly am. I've been there on numerous occasions and I'm familiar with it for many years since I actually went to Rutgers University and, and that's quite basically off campus, or on campus. And what is the um, the size of the lot? Well, a lot is basically a half acre lot. And uh, what, what are the present conditions on the, on the property? Basically, there's a few structures on there that are not being maintained. And uh, there's there are older homes, historic homes. And there's a property in question that is uh, proposed to have been taken, to be taken down and have an apartment house put in. Okay, and that's the four-story, 52-unit apartment building? Right, it's a four-story, 52-unit apartment building, 38 studios, and one-bedroom apartments, and 14 two-bedroom apartments. How will the apartment be provided for? They're going to have a ground level beneath the building in a garage with 43 parking spaces. Mr. Rupp what is the uh, purpose of your testimony tonight? Well, the purpose of my testimony was really to go over some of the different things going on with the site, the traffic and the traffic testimony, and try to uh, try to give the board some insight into other the other side of the story, so as to say, as to what the applicant case is, and we'll try to show a more unbiased presentation of the parking and what's going on in the neighborhood as opposed to the applicants just saying everything's perfect and there's no problems. <clears throat> what have you inspected or reviewed for purposes of your testimony tonight? Well, I reviewed the application, the plans, the tax maps, the master plans, the re-examination report, <coughs> and the past master plans, the college avenue redevelopment area, redevelopment plan, <coughs> the applicants filed various expert reports, Current zoning ordinance and zoning map, the resolution of the city approving the redevelopment zone in question as pertaining to tonight's application, as well as various traffic and parking documents that are available. Did you also review the site plan? Yes, I did. I reviewed the site plan basically for traffic concerns. Uh, it included the dumpster location, the lack of adequate turnaround space in the garage. There should be, for a garage, there should be basically one way in and one way out, not one through the driveway. You really want to get a good circulation in case there's, in case there's an accident on a drive. You don't want to block everything up. And all planning techs usually say, well, planning techs usually go into layouts of parking garages and parking so that you have a circulation where you come in one way, you come out one way. You don't go in all the way and then back out if there's no room. 
So you really want to have a, a good circulation plan. You looked at that, uh, we looked at uh, the number of parking spaces, and we feel that when we looked at it, there's a substantial number of parking spaces that are asked for in the variance. And the applicant is saying it's a de minimis, uh, a de minimis variance. And the de minimis exception, we have, we take uh, a different side of view. We feel that that's a substantial amount of parking that's not provided, it should be. What further comments do you have on the parking? Well, on parking, we looked at the redevelopment ordinance. The redevelopment ordinance, in particular, states that they should use the residential site improvement standards. Now, the applicant is saying, well, the city allows you to go through and, and get a parking variance any time you want because it's a de minimis exception. Well, it should be pointed out that when the redevelopment zone was made up, and the city had the opportunity to modify the parking, and it did. It modified it for different uses in the zone. It did not modify it for the residential parking. And it decided at that point to utilize the residential site improvement standards. It didn't have to use the residential site improvement standards because the residential site improvement standards themselves say that if, in fact, the city has or passes an ordinance as part of the redevelopment zone, they can use whatever type of ordinances they want for parking, whatever else, and have that approved by the DCA as part of the redevelopment zone. The city opted not to do that. They opted to maintain the residential site improvement standards. And in addition, the city passed resolutions by the planning board, the board, and the city council. And both of those resolutions from the two bodies stated that they felt that the residential site improvement standards were consistent with the master plan and the redevelopment zone. How many housing units are proposed? Excuse me? How many housing units are proposed? Okay, let's see. There are 38 studio or one bedroom and 14 two bedroom, 52. <coughs> How much parking is required? Well, the parking, according to the City Redevelopment Ordinance, as well as the Residential Site Improvement Standards, calls for 96 spaces. Basically, 68 spaces for the one bedroom and studio, and 28 spaces for the two bedroom, a total of 96 spaces. And the 96 spaces are kind of short because they're only provided 43. It's a variance of 53 spaces. That's a variance of over 55%, which to me is not the minimum. So, uh, can you please elaborate on why you feel the applicant is not providing enough parking? Well, I visited the site and seen myself there's no on-street parking spaces available with or without a permit at times during the week and during different times of the year. Prior to the scheduled meeting in June, I noted that there were 14 vacant spots. Prior to the meeting in October, there were two vacant spots around 6 o'clock. Prior to the meeting on November 18th, there were four vacant spots. Prior to the city meeting on December 9th, there were only four vacant spots. Now, we performed a 12-hour parking study from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on May 1st, on a Thursday. And during that time, we found there were approximately 118 spaces on Mine and Union Street, and only nine spaces were available at times for parking at around 10.30 in the morning. Other times that we looked at, there were only three or four spaces that I looked at it. Uh, the applicant is not going to ask for any parking permits for the residents of this building. No resident parking or visitor permit. This is problematic. Since there is minimal parking on the area, giving up the right to park without a permit doesn't really do much. You're giving up the right to not park in a spot where you can't park. There's no parking there. It doesn't do much good to give up a permit that you can't use. It's, it's great if it was going to do something, but it doesn't. Now, the applicant Jesper testified on November 18th that the on-street parking is at capacity and some on-street parking may be lost. So if you lose a couple of spots and you have a maximum of time of four spaces and you lose one or two more, you're going to have maximum two spaces on-street 
during that six or seven o'clock on a weekday night when I've lived there three or four times now. Are there any other parking studies that review parking in this area to show? Yes, them? there were a couple. One of them was the New Brunswick Ad Hoc Parking Permit Advisory Committee study, which was adopted on September 21st, 2000. And this had some really alarming concerns that I've noted. One, on page 10, investors are seen, I quote, investors are seen as unconcerned about the massive parking problems caused by loading off-campus housing units into the second, fifth, and sixth ward with the maximum allowable number of occupants. Page 10 of the report. Quote, approximately 7,000 of the 11,910 commuting permit holders have access to the University Park and College Avenue campus, but there are only 700 available on-campus spaces. What happens to the remaining 6,300 holders of commuter passes that are, where are they parking? They're parked on the city streets, page 10 of the report. Students are not concerned about tickets and consider the cost of education. One quote, one violator stated that she and her roommates had already incurred over $400 in tickets and they were not all concerned about accumulating more tickets for page four of the report. Snow in the area is not cleared from streets but plowed towards side. This creates hazardous conditions since the street widths are effectively reduced, page 16 of the report. The report finds that the current circumstances justify a formal declaration of a parking crisis and parking and traffic emergency, page 23 of the report. The Permit Parking Authority Committee finds that units occupied by transitory residents not only use an unfair percentage of the available on street parking, but also account for more violations than use of enforcement. So there's a substantial number of conclusions that were given in that report that are very problematic to this application. And it's just the same thing that's happening again and again. Now, when they meant transitory residents in that report, what they meant was students. And the problem that they had with students is that usually if you have a one or two, a dwelling unit, usually a single dwelling unit will have two people with one car in it, a family with one car. If in fact you have students, usually you have two or three students in a single apartment and they'll have two or three cars. So basically what happens is the more students and more transitory people you have, the more needs of parking spaces. Were there any other reports uh, in the city? Yes, there was a report on parking and transportation committee from Rutgers the State University of New Jersey dated November 99. This report also had alarming data. First thing was the study <coughs> indicated on street parking spaces on and around the campus show occupancy rates close to 100% and remain full most of the day, pages two and three of the report. Excessive student parking, legal and illegal, in residential areas in New Brunswick, especially in the 5th and 6th Ward, the areas closest to the College Avenue campus, creates problems for New Brunswick residents. The number of cars per square kilometer in this area is three to six times higher than the city average. The number of parking permits requested is three times greater than the actual on-street spaces. <clears throat> that was page six of the report. Uh, the Rutgers study stated that there is evidence in students reveals that some will actually budget for parking tickets or will carpool with other students that will not only park illegally and split the ticket cost. So you can take a look at not one study, but two studies that are consistent with the same results. <coughs> Were there any other studies on student parking? Well, there is another one. There's a trip in parking generation for student-oriented housing developments by Elizabeth Francis Hammer dated May 2013. This is a report that looked at housing at 23, 26 sites in three different college towns that are not, not in New Brunswick, but in Clemson and Auburn and Alabama and Tuscaloosa. So basically there were three college towns in this apartment complex. Now this is not New Brunswick, but it's an IT report. The IT is the Institute of Transportation Engineering. And the IT reports are the same IT reports that were looked at by the applicant. The applicant used IT reports on housing, and the housing reports he used were based on 
basically residential housing. This is an IT report that sits well on college and college students. And basically it finds two conclusions to it. It says that student housing does not follow the same trends as general apartments and recommended a new trip generation category in parking demand is higher at student oriented housing as opposed to general apartment housing development. And it also says student housing generates one third the amount of traffic in the regular apartment. And this is probably due to the fact that students have campus bus and walk or use bicycles. And three, the peak demand for students was greater, 50% greater than the average peak period parking demand for apartments and other uses. But basically what it's saying is that once you're on campus and you're in a campus-oriented area during the week, you don't you generate as many traffic trips or you don't get as many people getting in cars and driving. That's about half as many as normal. But you have about half as many parking spaces, twice as many parking spaces needed because they have their cars to use to go out, to go home with, to go to jobs with, to do other things with. So what the study is saying that after looking at these different sites, that the parking is short and you have to plan for more parking and the number of trips that it generates is much less than a normal apartment. So you're not going to get the traffic, but you are going to get a need for more parking. That's what it's saying. Mr. Whitmorning, what is your opinion of the applicant's uh uh, parking report. Well, the report wasn't based on fuel observation or counts or on the ordinance. It was based on undocumented generality. For example, no documentation was provided for the claim that the failure to grant a parking variance would be unduly burdensome. Well, since when is the requirement to follow the ordinance a burden? It should be something that you shouldn't have a problem with. It's called for in the master plan, it's called for in the ordinances, ordinances. It's and it's found, and the parking was found to be consistent with the master plan and the ordinances by, by the master plan, by the, uh, by this, basically by the planning board as well as by the council. And the applicant's parking analysis never once considered reducing the size of the development or increasing the front yard setbacks or reducing the height or, or changing the site plan at all. It just went along with what's going on. What's also interesting is that it indicated that in New Brunswick, using census data, 34% of the residents do not have cars. Well, if 34% don't have cars, that would mean 66% do. So you should plan for 66% of the people having cars, not, having, not for 55% of the people not having cars. If, if that's the actual thing that you're going to look at, don't twist it and then provide the opposite and say that you're, do you're documenting the need, you're documenting your requirements and you're documenting your variance by <coughs> providing less parking than citywide is required. And we already showed that apartments in con college towns with college students require more parking, so you're double cutting it doesn't make any sense. The applicant notes that the IT indicates the parking demand is low as 0.33 parking spaces per vehicle. We don't know where that number came from, but uh, it's lower than any I've seen anywhere. And it still certainly doesn't match up with the IT studies that have to do with parking in colleges, in college towns. The IT report for college towns would recommend about 126 parking spaces for this site. In your opinion, uh, Mr. Whitmore, does the proposal reflect sound traffic planning considerations and principles? No, sir. In my considered professional opinion, it's basically like putting 96 cars into a 43-car lot. It just doesn't fit. You're going to need the parking spaces, but they're not there. And they're not available on, stri on street. They're just not available anywhere in that area. In other places, what we've often recommended is that when there's a variance required, that the municipality pass a, an ordinance so that if there's a variance, a certain amount of money will be put up by any developer, so many dollars for parking space, and for the variance of the parking space, so that the money can be used by the city to actually purchase areas to provide off-street parking for residents in the area. 
And that's been done in some municipalities that we represent. <coughs> Is a uh, parking variance required? Yes. Obviously, we know the parking variance is required because there's a 55% misuse of uh, the ordinance. It doesn't need the ordinance by 55%. Um, the redevelopment plan says that since the building will be managed by the applicant, construction management, the applicant is required to provide parking that complies with the new front of zoning ordinance. The applicant, the applicant for the zoning ordinance 1705.020 plus three parking requirement would need to provide 96 spaces. Since he's providing 43 spaces, at least 53 spaces will have to be found in the neighborhood. The applicant's engineer has produced a letter in support of the applicant's and minimum exception request as it states it relates to the following. The letter contains various <coughs> assertions and no parking studies, on-site or personal observations of this or other sites in the city. It's a number of parking take spaces to be provided. The proposed garage parking area carries several additional waivers. They include a waiver for parking space size. The site plan calls for 9 by 18 stalls. The redevelopment plan calls for 9 by 20. I personally don't think the 9 by 18 stalls is a problem versus the 9 by 20 because the size, the length of cars are are being, becoming smaller and they're becoming shorter and wider as trends go on. So I don't think that's a problem. Providing a single entrance and exit to the garage. The applicant, by providing only one entrance and exit to the underground parking garage, is creating an unsafe condition, as I mentioned before. The lack of an alternate vehicular access point would hinder emergency personnel from responding in a fast and safe manner if there's a problem at the entrance spot. The lack of an alternate vehicle access point creates a dead end dial without a place to allow a vehicle to turn around. Now, when there's a shortage of parking, parking magazines and books. And the IP comes out with one called the Transportation Impact Analysis for Site Development. In it, it addresses parking. <coughs> and basically, it basically states that on page 97, and I can quote, in addition to effect and convenience, the number of parking spaces and the design of parking facilities may have a bearing on the facility's efficiency and the user's safety. Inadequate parking capacity tends to lead to damage to parked cars, illegal parking, loss of customers and parking both on and off site in areas that can impair site distance, decrease capacity, and affect internal circulation. And basically, what's happening here is if you don't provide the proper circulation where people can come in or out, and you have a shortage. People are going to park in front in the driveway. They're going to go in and turn, park in the proposed turnaround areas. So nobody, the next person that comes in will have a spot to park or to turn around. Then they have to back around to a whole U. Now they have to back across the sidewalk with a large parking lot across the street with another drive. It's not the safest condition. You have to have an entrance and then circulation in the area to make it work better. Mr. Warnia, is the um, <clears throat> parking deviation consistent with the RSIS standards? No, it's not consistent with the RSI standards. Section 5.21-3.1G is not consistent in intended site development program since there is inadequate parking provided for the future residents and the lack of parking and inadequate setback creates a dangerous situation which will add to the existing illegal parking Double parking at times, a narrow street width, and unsafe pedestrian vehicle or traffic interface. The parking variance is only burdensome due to the overdevelopment of the site, not due to the physical conditions of the site. A parking variance does not meet the needs of public health and safety, but is contrary to the needs of public health and safety by significantly reducing the amount of parking required in an area already significantly short of parking. It does not take into account the existing residential homes in the area and proposed to be significantly more intensely developed, creating a traffic and parking problem in one of the areas most short of available on street parking with significant illegal parking at times. Mr. Lamorian, do you have any conclusions? In my considered professional opinion, the parking variance is not de minimis. 
is approximately 55% and so significant it creates a severe adverse impact on the adjacent residents. The building is not in conformance with adjacent property. There's not enough on-street parking to handle the severe undersupply of parking in the area. Specifically, one, there is no on-street parking available. Thus, forfeiting parking permits by the applicant is meaningless. The redevelopment ordinance passed by the city had the chance to change parking requirements and did, in fact, liberalize parking for other uses. But for residential uses, it specifically called for using the RSIS standard. The city then authorized this ordinance as provided and found it to be in conformance with the master plan, and so should this board. There's no study by the applicant saying what the real demand for parking is or at any one of the apartment houses. There is no study shown or provided. A recent study of, resident, of residential students that was done by ITE did not use vehicles that found that students did not use vehicles every day. They parked them on campus and used them when they wanted to. In this area, they can't park them on campus all the time, so sometimes they park them in those areas where permits are not required for parking. So if you park those cars park in those areas, you're just pushing the problem further away from campus. Thus, the, the trip and parking generation for student-oriented development, housing development by Hammer by IT showed that there was significantly more parking spaces used than anticipated. It predicted a need for 126 spaces from the data. And the reason being that IT and RSIS usually had one or two drivers at the most in the apartment, while college students often had two to three drivers per apartment. And usually the college apartments didn't have to provide any co-op housing. The parking shortage was verified in the Budget Parking Study and the City's Parking Study. The parking shortages were very significant. The comments in the city's parking report notes developers are seen as not concerned about parking but maximizing residential units. The parking variance uh, should not be granted by this board. And one other item I did want to bring up was the shared parking space. The applicant said that a shared parking space would account for approximately 15 parking spaces. Well, basically, if you look through all the literature on the shared parking spaces, most of it is in Seattle, in Portland, and the West Coast. And most of that is deal dealing with citywide parking garages, where the city has parking garages throughout the downtown areas, and you can park in any one of them or go between one garage and another. It's not geared towards one single unit or one single housing unit. Is geared towards a, a citywide system of parking so you can shuttle between different parts of the city and different areas. And then anybody can get in one car and go to another spot and shift around. And in that area, usually it was, usually they found that three or four turnovers occurred per space. A maximum of six turnovers occurred per space. Per space. So at the most, you would have the space used by six different cars during a day. And that would be only if you had a citywide system of garages <coughs> and uh, parking lots that had the same type of zip car or whatever else you wanted to use. But it wouldn't be just for one car parking space within one housing unit. That doesn't really cut it. It's a different type of analysis. So I would say, say in summation that for all the reasons that I mentioned in the report, I don't think that the uh, applicants application should be approved with the intensity of development that they're asking for. I think it should be downgraded to a lower amount of housing units, more, more consistent with the house, with the number of parking spaces that can be provided. Mr. Litwarnia, um, did you have an opportunity to take a look at um, New Jersey Administrative Code section 521-4.14F? Yes, I did before. Yeah. And is it your interpretation of that section, sir, that if no off-street parking is available, doesn't that mean that the applicant has to comply with the, uh, the RISA standard? Well, usually what it means is if you don't have enough off-street parking available, then you would have to go along with what the ordinance called for. Um, you can still get, as a minimum, you can still get an exception to that if you did a study, a detailed study. But the applicant didn't do a detailed study. All he did was mention that there's a 
uh, census data that's available that shows that there would be, a, and there are bus and transit available. So he said, since there's bus and transit available, that is his study. That's not what it calls for. It calls for a detailed study in the residential site improvement standard that makes a detailed study that says, in these apartment complexes that we looked at, there were 14 X units, and out of those 14 units, so many people had cars parked around them, or so many people hadn't parked on campus or wherever else. It doesn't, and even if he did follow what the applicant said, the applicant, as I pointed out before, said the census data pointed out that there would be a certain amount of number of parking spaces that the average number of cars per resident in the city were, and the applicant didn't provide that number. He provided half of that number, basically. So he didn't follow his own analysis. So there's no really detailed analysis or detailed study as required by the residential site improvement standard. Since there was none, he'd have to follow the ordinance and his minute exception might not be accepted. Especially since especially since it's in a it's in a special zone. And in the special zone had the, the town had the city rather had the ability to change the requirements in that zone and kept them on purpose. Thank you, Mr. Whitmore. Um, just give me a moment. De minimis in terms of this section and and you know traffic engineering. What does that mean? What does it mean? One or two spaces? Well, to me, usually I consider de minimis. Around five, a maximum of ten percent. And this is fifty-five percent. That's a little bit higher than ten percent. Yeah. So then, based upon all your studies that you reviewed, your review of the the, the plans that um, and the, the town documents, um, your actual field observations, which no one else has done in this application, um, is it your testimony that? Um, uh, this area could not uh, tolerate um, this variance if it were granted? There's no proof by the applicant showing that, in, that an exception to the local standard would be allowed because the, standard, the, the study that was done by the applicant doesn't show what the number of the parking spaces are in the street. We looked at that, there are almost nothing. So since there's nothing, you would have to come up with a an actual study from different to show what the actual number of cars used in other apartments would be. And he's not doing that. He's just saying we looked at the census data, and since there's a census data it says that everybody in New Brunswick doesn't have a car, and since there's bus public transit, we're just not going to provide the parking because we don't need to, because we can still rent the all we can still rent these buildings and we don't really care about the parking problem. That's basically what it comes down to. Thank you. I have nothing further at the moment. Uh, Mr. LeBourne, let me just ask you a few things. I'm sorry, Mr. Kelson. Yeah, if I may interrupt, Madam Chair. Yes. I just wanted to clarify one point. Um, I, my understanding was that the, uh, the witness was being proffered as a traffic engineer. Yes. I did hear some, uh, some opinion as to whether the planning justifications were appropriate or proper as they were presented in relation to the, uh, I guess, to the, the uh, parking variance. I, I would instruct the board that uh, an expert, and this is an expert in the field of traffic engineering, that's what it's been proffered as, uh, cannot opine on another area of expertise where another expert would be uh, more appropriate, for instance, a planner. So the board can certainly consider or can take into account what the witnesses testify to as to whether there was a hardship variance that should or should not have been granted, uh, but certainly cannot give it the same way as that as a, of an expert testifying in the area of planning. All right, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, can, I can handle that with Mr. Lemornia right now. Um, Mr. Lemornia, um, are you also a professional planner in the state of New Jersey? Yes, I am also a professional planner in the state of New Jersey for a number of years. And have you... Um, given planning testimony in front of uh, numerous boards in the state of New Jersey? Yeah. How many, on approximately how many occasions? <clears throat> Probably, I can't count them all. And uh, have you ever been um, 
reject it as an expert in planning in connection with your traffic engineering testimony at any of those locations? Well, I was also a director of planning, Tri-State Regional Planning Commission. I was, direct, I was also a member of the Middlesex County Transportation Board in the past. And I was a resident of Edison Township for over 20 years. And that gave me great familiarity with this area. I, we represented on ad hoc basis various municipalities as planners, including Fort Lee, as well as uh, City of Bloomfield. And as a director of planning, we would overlook the traffic and, and traffic and transportation and the plans for all the counties in Northeast New Jersey, the City of Newark, and the City of Jersey City, as well as New York City and Southwestern Connecticut. So I'm quite familiar with master plans and master plan grants that we Madam Chair, I would take the position that um, uh, I can qualify Mr. Lamorne as a professional planner as well as a traffic engineer, and that the conclusions that he drew um, should be given uh, full weight. He's accepted as well. Thank you. So that one of them, let me just ask you a few questions. We all agree that the RSIS standard is in the redevelopment plan because it's required to be in the redevelopment plan. Isn't yeah. that true? No. The residential standard, residential site improvement standards are valid. I didn't say they weren't valid. I said they're required to be in the plan. You indicated there was a process that the city could have gone through. It's a lengthy process in order to be able to develop a different standard other than RSIS if the city chose to do that citywide. No. Obviously, the city didn't do that, so no. it's required to be in the plan. No. That was your testimony. No, maybe you're misinterpreting it. What I said was that the city, when it developed the redevelopment plan, was allowed to make its own criteria up. It did make its own parking criteria up for various land uses. It was allowed to make parking criteria for residential uses up as well. It chose not to. The residential site improvement standards quote that you are able to use your own local standards as part of the development redevelopment zone if you so desire, have it approved by an ordinance and submitted to the DCA. That was not done. The planning board decided to make to change the parking bearing parking retirements in certain areas of the city, but it, in that redevelopment zone for certain uses. But it chose not to change the parking requirements of residential uses. It decided to use the residential site improvement standards in that area. You are aware of the fact that there's already been testimony that it was that it was the city's position that it was required to be in the redevelopment. Well, you're in error because whoever gave that testimony was wrong. And we can quote to the RSIS if you want to. Well, let's move well, on. Well, no, it's not yeah. move on. I think that's a very important point that should be brought up to the board. What I stated was what is the truth. What the board was granted information by the previous board attorney, who is not here at the present time, that the board was required to follow the resident I, I object to this. I'm not and referring not to the prior attorney, and I don't believe it's appropriate for him to raise that. Well, you brought it up. No, I didn't. I didn't bring up the prior you said attorney. That, you did. No, you said that it was, question, it was previously sorry. testified to. It wasn't previously testified to. It was brought up by the previous attorney, and it was an error. That, that is not accurate. Shall we it's bring that up? Then I think that you should ask me <coughs> to bring that up and what's quoted for the board. I think it's of utmost importance. Because I think that's, that mis misconception has got to be cleared up. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, in section 5.21-3.5, special area standards. In this, it's that I could quote and read it. The commissioner and the site improvement advisory board, as a matter of policy, recognize the need for preservation and or enhancement of community character in New Jersey municipality. This section is intended to provide a procedure whereby a municipal approving authority may develop and recommend to the board supplementary 
and or alternate standards in the form of municipal ordinance review and amendment to this chapter. The Site Improvement Advisory Board shall solicit the input of the Department of Environmental Protection, the Office of Smart Growth, and the Department of Transportation may elicit input from private or private or from public or private organizations and individuals that deems appropriate during the review, during the process of review, special area standards. A special area designation may be applied by ordinance by a municipality or a group of municipalities to an area or areas of a municipality or municipalities exhibiting or plan to exhibit a distinctive character or environmental feature that the municipality or municipalities by ordinance have identified and expressed a desire to preserve and enhance. Examples of a special area may include designated redevelopment areas. So that I, I'm not there. disputing what that says. I was disputing what was previously testified to. That's what our dispute is. So I'm moving on from that. You're reading from the standard, and I understand it. My point is the city, whether it was the planning board, the council, the planning department chose not to make an application either for this plan or the city or citywide to change any of the parking standards and therefore the RSIS standard was mandated to be in that plan. Is that Correct. accurate? Correct. That was, they decided not to change them. They decided not to change it for whatever reason. They decided not to change it specifically in a plan or citywide. And they stated it was consistent with the master plan. So therefore, it was required to be in the plan. It was required to be followed. It was required to be followed by the plan. Required. Correct. Because the redevelopment plan was not changed and it was Correct. not altered as it could have been. But the plan also provides for the ability to seek variances. You can seek variances at all times. On exactly. Okay. So let's let's talk about and you refer to the other plans that you looked at. You actually did review the master plan uh, re reconsideration in 2012? Yes. Okay. And is it not true that the 2012 re-examination specifically refers to a recommendation for student housing parking? Does it not? Uh, what was that again? Well, the 2012 master plan re-examination actually makes a recommendation with regard to the parking requirement for student housing, does it not? I believe it did, yes. Yeah, you, you, you reviewed it, correct? You reviewed the 2012 master yeah. plan re-examination? It does it not say, quote, establish realistic parking ratios for on-site parking. If the project is limited to areas of walkability and mass transit access, then parking ratios could be lower than those of more suburban areas. If student housing is anticipated, a ratio of one on-site space per unit and or 0.5 spaces per bedroom should be considered. If that standard were followed, this application would comply, would it not? No. It wouldn't? Why wouldn't it comply? Because you're not using your, you are not putting only all student housing into the site. And it says if student housing is quite... anticipated, no. I don't think it's, there's any way to guarantee it's only going to be student housing in there. I think if, if it was a guarantee that it would only be student housing, then I feel it, would be, it should be followed, but I don't feel it would. But the master plan re-examination anticipates that student housing requires less of a parking requirement. Because That's what the master plan re-examination says, does it not? It also said it should be analyzed. It does say, in fact, that the standard should be less. It says it could be less, but it should say, it also says it should be analyzed, okay. and be reviewed, and it hasn't been analyzed. All right, now let's take a look at RSIS standards, which you've talked a lot about. Okay. Okay? And you've seen the May 27, 2014 letter from the Department of Community Affairs that was addressed to Mr. Patterson? I've heard it read, yeah. Yeah, okay. Does it not say and I'll, I'll quote it, and this is a result of Mr. Patterson sending a series of application approvals to the state to review for de minimis exceptions. And I quote, only one of the resolutions had a variation to the RSIS. It dealt with the number of parking spaces. Application number Z2010-007 
approved fewer parking spaces for an 82 unit development than required by Table 4.4 of the, ISR, the RSIS. The reason was proximity to other transportation options. The SIAB intends for local reviewers to have a great deal of flexibility over parking. NJ, NJAC 5-21-4.14C specifies alternative standards to those shown in Table 4.4 shall be accepted if the applicant demonstrates these standards better reflect local conditions. Factors affecting minimum number of parking spaces include household characteristics, availability of mass transit, urban versus suburban locations, and availability of off-site parking resources. Is that not, in fact, a very flexible standard that allows the local reviewer to determine a standard other than what is in the RSIS requirement? Well, it's a flexible standard if there's justification put in, and those justifications include some type of analysis and study showing what the actual amount of parking requirement is needed by some of these different uses. And I don't feel that this application has shown that. Well, your opinion is you, you don't accept the testimony, but there was a significant amount of testimony from the professionals, from the applicant, identifying those specific factors that would give rise to allowing for a lesser standard, did they not? No, there was testimony that there were a lot of uses here. There, were, there was transit use in the area, rail transit as well as bus transit, and since there was rail as well as bus transit, the applicant should automatically grant it a minimum exception of 55% <coughs> because of that. And then, because the census showed that there was only 66% of the people had cars in the city, that you could get by with 45%, handling 45%. That's twisted. So the analysis that was provided by the applicant himself showed that there's more of a need for parking in the city than is being provided. And therefore, there should be probably an exception, given, but not to the extent that the applicant is asking for. Well, did not the applicant testify as to actual experience from other projects in the same area? You were here for all the testimony, were you not? I was here when he testified he could rent it. And the housing plans, the parking plans, excuse me, all said that they could be rented, but they all said that, that the builders didn't care about the parking needs in the area. The parking study said that the only thing the builders were interested in is building as many units they could and renting them and forgetting the parking. I didn't ask you that question. I asked you what was testified to. You were here listening to the professional testimony with regard to actual experience in the sixth ward in New Brunswick with regard to the parking demand for this type of housing that's actually been built by the applicant. Is that not a pretty good uh, basis to determine what actually is needed other than studies, which we'll no, get to, that happened in Auburn or Alabama? No, it's no. not. And the reason it's not is because the applicant never said or looked at any one of the housing unit developments that were built to find out how many people in those, how many cars were actually in those developments and where they're parking. He did, did you? No, I'm well, not let the applicant. Me, well, let me ask you specifically. Did you look at 66 sidecar street? Let him finish his answer. He answered it. Go ahead. Did you, did you do any analysis of 66 Sycard Street where there was actually a, a variance granted for 34 units with 31 spaces, which is 0.9, and see whether it worked? No. The only thing I did was look at the amount of parking available in the exact area that we're dealing with. In the exact area we're dealing with, we found that there's basically no on-street parking available. Oh, and there's no permits, giving away the permits for it doesn't make any sense. We're, we're talking about what the actual demand is for parking spaces. So you didn't look to see whether or not that variance actually was successful. It's only a couple of blocks away. You didn't look at it. That's your testimony, <clears throat> correct? Correct. I didn't look at it to okay. see. I didn't look and study that because it wasn't on my street. Okay. Did you look at 6 Sycard Street, where this applicant built a, a facility with a parking variance 18 spaces for 23 units, or 0.88%. Did you actually go there and see whether it was actually working or not? 
One, I didn't go actually go out there to see if it was working or not. I didn't look at that. I didn't see what was presented as evidence and testimony to justify that. And I don't know if it's working or not. Well, you have plenty of opportunity that was testified to months ago. You could have done that. Could you not have? I could have done what? Actually look to see whether one of these variances that we're seeking here by this applicant actually works the way they say it will. Wouldn't that be important to know whether it actually works? It would be beyond the scope of my client. You know. Okay. So therefore, you though also didn't go then to 15 Union Street, which is right around the corner, to see whether or not the 11 spaces for 18 units or 0.6% actually work. You didn't do that either. It wasn't part of this application. Okay. So I didn't study it. It was right around the corner, so it would be pretty relevant, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be pretty relevant that maybe the applicant should have shown it to us. He testified to it. He did not. He testified that there's a fully a rented unit in this area. Well, I think they differ with you, but we'll, get, we'll ultimately required. see the transcript. It didn't require, it, the, the study is to know how many cars are required by the residents to be parked, not but, to know if you can rent it. No. Don't you think it's relevant for this board to see whether or not a previous variance granted for a similar type of facility in a same location for approximately the same ratio actually works the way they say it's going to work. Well, you don't consider works, that to be relevant? We're parking on street. There's no parking on street. If it worked, there'd be some on-street parking available. Wouldn't there be? Well, you wouldn't know. You didn't go look, did you? There's none on my street. And this is in my street. street. Did you look on Union Street? Yes, and there's none on, no available parking on Union ever. Did you look at 50 Union Street, another okay, project? Ever. Let me retract that. Never during the times when I inspected it was there parking on Union Street. Did you look at 50 Union Street, in this case 17 spaces for 24 units, 0.7%. You didn't look at that one either, I assume, correct? So you don't know whether it actually works, because you didn't look. No, it wasn't part of my charge to look and see okay. if I had everything. That's fair. It's not part of this application. I only looked at this application, so I don't know if the other applications were justified differently or more substantially or did run or were but done correctly. Would it not I be, it would like be relevant, project. would it not, to know whether or not similar projects with similar variances in similar locations actually work in the city of New Brunswick? Objection asked and answered several times. I'll move on. Let's talk about Elizabeth Hammer. You've mentioned Elizabeth Hammer, correct? Yeah. Okay. Elizabeth, let's put it in perspective. Elizabeth Hammer is not an ITT study, is it not? It was done as a it was done as a study for uh, a PhD paper. Right, it was a master's thesis, wasn't it? I thought it was a PhD. It was a master's thesis that was okay. written by a young lady for her master's, and she studied some locations, correct? She studied three colleges. She studied three colleges. Could you tell us which ones they were? I think I did. Well, they were in three college towns. The three college towns were in Clemson, uh, Tuscaloosa, and Auburn. Auburn, University of Auburn, University of Alabama, and, Univers and Clemson University, correct? Correct. And she studied those, and they were considered to be college towns, correct? Correct. Okay. And did, where the definition of college town came from, do you know where that comes from? Well, they were considered college towns, and she, she studied only college housing in those towns. Well, my question is, do you know the definition of college town? Did she define that, or did she get it from someplace else? Well, I didn't classify it as a college town. I don't. Well, she did, so that's well, what's relevant because she quoted her study. So, do you know where she got that from? No. Well, I'll tell you, she got it from a book that defined what a college town was, and she utilized that in her study to, to identify those three universities as college, being located in college towns. Do you know whether or not Rutgers University is considered a college town? We consider that section of New Brunswick part of the college town. Well, according to the study and the definitions that were used, it would not be a college town. Do you know what it would be? No, what would it be? It would be a college located in a, in a city. And you quoted the study, and you're the expert. 
They make a <laughs> distinction between those two things, don't they? She does. She makes a big distinction. Doesn't she make a big distinction? I don't find that a problem. Okay, well, let's go to what she calls a college town, which were in, where Auburn, Alabama, and Clemson were located, and let's see what conclusion she reaches. And by the way, the book she uses is Gumbrecht 2003. Is that familiar to you? No. That's where the definition comes from. I assumed you knew because you, you use this in your expert testimony. Do you know how far away the housing facilities that she studied were located from the campus of the college that she was actually studying. I don't recall. If I told you it was 2.3 miles away from the campus, wouldn't that be a factor in whether or not the people who lived in the housing required, uh, would be potentially be required to have cars? It would be something to consider. Okay. So let's go to the part of her study where she talks about colleges located in cities, which is what Rutgers University is. And do you recall the reference to the Minnesota model? No. Okay, well, she refers to the Minnesota model, the University of Minnesota, being a college located in a city. And do you recall what conclusion she reached when she made that distinction? No. I'll read them to you. Recent growth in new residential construction surrounding the University of Minnesota encouraged a study of the trip generation rates of newly constructed and occupied student-oriented apartment buildings. A highly populated urban area, unlike Auburn, Therefore, the building had rough, I'm going to quote specific areas. Therefore, the buildings had roughly one parking stall for every two units. With plenty of unit housing, multiple students, automobile ownership appears to be very low among students in this area. The results suggest that student housing generates approximately one third the amount of traffic as generic apartments. <clears throat> the conclusion that was reached in this study that <coughs> you, you, you state as a basis for your testimony states that one parking stall for every two units, or 0.5, ratio is what is being actually shown as being uh, generated by the University of Minnesota and, and colleges that are located in urban areas, which is consistent with the 2012 master plan reevaluation that comes to the same conclusion with the same recommendation. Now I ask you, since you quote this study, do you accept what she has to say here? Or does, is the study that formed the basis of your testimony no longer relevant? No, it's still valid. Okay. And it's, it's, similar, it's the same conclusion that was in the city's, last city's parking report, where it said that because these are student homes, they usually get, in their transitory, they usually get one parking car per one vehicle per resident as opposed to one per two people for normal residents. So both the standard that she cites in the Minnesota model in her master's thesis and the 2012 master plan recommendation find a consistent standard for student housing which is consistent with the application that's being presented to this board. Isn't that correct? No. It's not consistent with what you're telling the board because you haven't got any facts or figures to back it up. The, the parking studies from the city of New Brunswick do, and they show that there's a great shortage of parking in that whole area due to the fact that there's residents as well as college students in that area. And there is no study done by the applicant of any of those 
housing units that the applicant is familiar with since they built them or own them and they are able to go into them. And there was no data provided from any of them. And that's what was required by the ordinance of the city of New Brunswick, as well as the IT. And I said, when I went through and referenced it, I said that there are two sources. One was the local parking authority sources, the local parking study, and the other was this one. And this one, what I mentioned in it, was the same criteria, which is that, there, that they mentioned in this report, that the number of trips is significantly lower, which I feel is true. And secondly, I felt that the number of parking spaces that are being provided is low. And I did say, as a conclusion, I think that there should be a reduction in the units as a conclusion that would be more in line with the actual needs for the parking for the unit. So, so in your opinion, it's more important to have a study, to study the theory of how much parking should be generated, rather than the direct testimony of the applicant and his professionals as to their actual experience from four different projects of similar size, similar parking rate, uh, variances, in similar locations. Your study would be more important than the actual experience. Is that your testimony? No, my testimony isn't that. My testimony is that there's no study done by the applicant to prove that this is that the numbers he's using is correct, as required by the RSIS as well as by the ordinance. And the reason that the, these things are done now and that there's such a critical problem of parking in this area right now at this time is the fact that there is not enough parking and people are parking all over the street and illegally parking and they're not addressing, and the applicant is not addressing that parking need by saying what actual parking requirements are for those units that he built. There is a real need out there for parking. It's not RSIS number, but the applicant hasn't gotten any feel for what it is. All the applicant's doing is saying, if we build it and we fill it up, it doesn't matter how many parking spaces we have because everyone else will park on the street, I'll be illegal or not. You would know that because you never even studied them. You never asked, you never went to the location, you didn't see the, the garages and how many spaces were empty. You didn't do any analysis of that, which would have been very helpful, would it not, to, in order to determine what the actual experience is currently in that location. Well, the ordinance the, R, well, the RSIS as well as the, the ordinances that you're quoting all call for an analysis, and no analysis was done by the applicant except for the ones that were provided, and those were shown to be fallacious. Except practical fallacious experience. Because they don't meet what the actual needs are in the city. If you don't follow the, the needs for the uh, census data, and you quote the census data as the reason why you're doing it, then how can you say that it's adequate? So in your opinion, the actual practical experience of similar projects is not relevant? No, I'm saying that the actual numbers of how many cars are used by those facilities has not been provided by the applicant as part of the study. I have no further questions. I have nothing further, Mr. Warney, at this time. Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. Um, Mr. LaGuardia, based on your uh, based on your testimony, you state that uh, you cite two studies, one done in 2000 and one done in 1999. Um, do you agree that there has been significant changes to the parking situation? Since that time, that Rutgers has addressed some of those issues with its parking standards or with providing parking for commuters, especially since 2000 or 1999? I can't answer that completely. I, I know that the same, the same shortage exists now in the street. There was basically the reports both indicated that there was almost 100%. Uh, on-street occupancy of parking, and it's still consistent. It's still 100% on-street. There might have been a reduction in total need, but it's still not. There's still not enough on-street, on-street or off-street parking. I mean, I, I think can't tell you what these absolute numbers of that shortage is. Right, and I think we can agree that Rutgers, <coughs> as far as the sixth ward is concerned, has kind of abdicated its responsibility. Uh, to provide housing for its students and turn much of that responsibility over to local developers who are try, trying to provide that sort of um, that sort of housing that Rutgers has 
well, starting to address, but hasn't addressed up until recently. So the, so the studies that you are citing are between 15 and 16 years old. Do you have anything more recent or relevant that can provide this board with some testimony that would state uh, that, you know, that would cite the significant changes in those conditions since 2000? You know, we're at 2015 now. I tried to find that, the answer to that question, and to look and see if there's any more recent studies. There weren't any more recent studies done. And they, one of, some of the problems that were noted in some of the newer letters that went back and forth that I could find between the city and Rutgers was that there was a feeling that Rutgers should do more to, to tell the students coming in where they could or couldn't park and where they could park and, and show them the problems with having on, having on campus cars. And that wasn't done and there was a supposedly that they, they were going to address it with more parking but in, that, in this area somewhere. But as far as I know, it never came to fruition. All right. I mean, we all understand that, that basically the Rutgers parking or the Rutgers bus system is one of the largest systems in, in the country. We've, we've heard testimony before this board in years past with regards to that. Um, and they are parking over at the stadium, they're parking over at Livingston. Most of the commuter right. parking has been addressed by that sort of parking. So that has not, again, that has all been since 2000. So I'm wondering if there has been a, an alleviation of the parking situation in New Brunswick since that time, if you could provide any kind of testimony or expert, expert testimony regarding that to this board. I couldn't find any newer studies than the ones we had. And I did look for some. And I made an effort to get to if we could get any from, right, from Rutgers or the city. Those were the only ones we could find. All right, well, thank you very much. Just one other question. You do agree that we do have some latitude as far as uh, applying those R RSIS standards, is that correct? I think so. I think if you look at the RSI standards, what it says is, I can pull that out. Basically, there's two parts. One part says if you have on-street parking, then you're allowed to use the on-street parking as part of your uh, your variance and support the variance with on-street parking. And in this instance, there is no on-street parking. The second thing that it says is you can try to get a local standard by doing an analysis. The applicant has provided that testimony to us already. Well, And what it said is, to quote it, the applicant provided some testimony. My point was that this is what the RSI calls for. And I'll read the two sections. When in the judgment the local approving authority on street parking is available, then only that poor portion of the parking requirement which is not available on the street shall be provided in all street parking facilities. That's one section that we said that there is no one street available. The second part that it mentions is alternative parking standards shall be accepted if the applicant demonstrates these standards better reflect that actual local conditions. Factors affecting minimum number of parking spaces include household characteristics, availability of mass transit, urban versus suburban location, and available ones of all strike parking resources. And it says you have to demonstrate that. It doesn't say you can just say we have it. We have buses, we have cars, we have bicycles, so therefore, we don't have to meet the RSIS. That's not what it said. It says you have to demonstrate it. Demonstrating it to me is you say, here's my apartment house. It has 75 units, and we have parking for 22, and the other 30 people or whatever have no car. Or these other cars are parked on campus somewhere, and they only go get them once in a while. And there's a need, for, or else some of them are parked on the street. But that's not demonstrated. The only thing that was demonstrated to me was that we, we, we had a census. The census said 66% of the people have, have cars in the city. It also said that we have transit. It also said that we have, we have uh, bus, mass transit by bus as well as train. But it didn't, say, it didn't demonstrate what percentage of anyone's doing that. Students aren't usually going to be taking the train to class. So it's going to be a bus going around. But as was testified, 
he needed a car at different times. And having been a student at Rutgers, knowing that if you want to go between one campus and the other, usually you would have trouble with bus transportation in some of the classes between campuses. If you're going between the Heights campus and a class at Douglas, you have a trouble you have trouble making a bus connection. So you have a car and then you those instances that's why people are paying for fines and carpooling, because they can't make some of them with the transit connection. So my feeling is, if you read the, reg the regulation specifically, it says demonstrate, and I don't feel it's demonstrated by just saying we have cars, we have buses, we have trains. That doesn't demonstrate. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, all testimonies can be found at our website, the next meeting. Do you have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Before we do that, yes. uh, announce, um, okay. we'll uh, continue the hearing. Um, the board's next meeting is February the 10th. Uh, we will make arrangements to uh, be able to come back uh, to this room uh, again. Um, so we'll be at 7.30 uh, p.m. February uh, 10th, Tuesday night, uh, back here in the three holders. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.